What I'm going to do this afternoon is uh, speak a little about the transformation that took place in my grandfather, how he believed that all of us can transform and become better human beings. And then I'm going to speak a little about the influence that he had on me um, when I lived with him as a young boy. And, um, you know, he, the lessons that he taught me. And then the last part of the talk will be about uh, our responsibility. And when he said that we must be the change we wish to see in the world, what did he mean by that? And how can we be the change? And what do we need to do about it? So this is broadly what I'm going to be dealing with. So let me start with my grandfather and the influences on him. As you were told in the introduction, one of the influences was my grandmother. But actually, he was influenced by three women when he was still very young. The first influence was from his mother. His mother was a very pious lady, very spiritual lady. And she, uh, typically like all Indian women, believed in uh, taking vows. And throughout the year, she would take vows of some sort or the other all the time. And, uh, you know, and, and, and observed those vows very, uh, very diligently. But the one vow that my grandfather felt very concerned about when he was a little kid, he was just five, six years old. And this was the vow that my grandmother, uh, my, her, his mother used to take of not eating until she saw the sun. Now, normally one would say, well, what's so great about it? You see the sun every day. But she took this vow during the monsoon season in India. And in the monsoon season in India, for sometimes for days together, uh, it's difficult to see the sun. The skies are overcast, and the sun just doesn't come out. So for all that time, she would remain hungry. And that concerned him very much, that she would cook the meals, and she would feed everybody, but she would not eat anything at herself. So grandfather writes in his autobiography that he used to spend uh, hours sitting at the window and praying to God to part the clouds for a few minutes and let the sun peep out so that his mother could see the sun and have something to eat. And when this happened, he would call out loudly to his mother, come quickly to the window, the sun is out. And sometimes by the time she could leave what she was doing and come up to the window, the sun would be covered up again. And uh, she, she would just smile and say, well, God doesn't want me to eat today, so that's OK, no problem. But that kind of spiritual devotion played a very important play, uh, part in his life there. The other uh, lady who influenced him was his nanny. Now, he was a very frisky young boy. He used to disappear from home and go, um, go away, you know, away from home just follow somebody or follow a procession and disappear. And so they decided to get a nanny to keep an eye on him. But he was also a very fearful young boy. He just could not deal with darkness. He could not get into a room that was dark. Uh, he, right up to his uh, late teens, he, he could not sleep in the room if there was no light there. He wouldn't enter the room unless there was some light there. And he feared all kinds of things. He was afraid of snakes. He was afraid of thieves. And he imagined a lot of these things. And there were snakes crawling around in the room and, and so on. So that fear was very potent in, 
in him. And his nanny told him, says, you should not fear because God is always there to protect us. And says, if you are afraid of anything, just chant the name of the Lord. And in the Hindu tradition, the name of the Lord would be Rama. So he said, just chant the name of Lord Rama and he'll protect you. So he got into the habit of chanting the name of uh, the Lord. And then the third person who influenced him was his wife, my grandmother. They were married at the age of 13 because that was uh, acceptable in the old Indian tradition. People got married very early. And uh, they were both 13 years old when they got married. And they started living together at the age of 16. And at that age, grandfather says he didn't know who was going to be the boss in that relationship, who was going to lay down the rules and enforce them. And so he started going to the library and reading books on the subject. And all these books were written by male chauvinists <laughs> because they all talked about how the husband should lay down the rules and enforce them strictly. So he came home one evening after reading this book and he told grandmother, he said, from tomorrow you are not going to stir out of the house without my permission. That's the law and you're going to obey it and I want no arguments about it. And grandmother didn't say anything at all. She didn't retort, she didn't respond to him. She just quietly went to bed, got up the next day and she continued to do what she always did, continued to go out and visit and never bothered to get grandfather's permission. So after a few days when Grandfather realized that uh, she was not obeying him. He confronted her again and he says, how dare you disobey me? Didn't I tell you that you are not to go out of the house without my permission? And at that point, very quietly, without raising her voice or getting angry, grandmother very quietly asked him. She says, I was brought up to believe that we must always obey the elders in the house. And I believe the elders in this house are your parents. Now, if you're trying to tell me that I should not obey your mother, but obey you instead, let me know so that I can go and tell your mother I'm not going to obey you anymore. <laughs> and of course, grandfather couldn't tell her to do that. And so the whole matter was settled without anybody losing their temper and getting angry. And grandfather said that that was the most profound lesson in nonviolent conflict resolution that he learned. <laughs> so it was grandmother who planted the seeds of nonviolent conflict resolution in his mind. And all of these lessons that he learned as a child made him realize that we should not be existing from birth to death, but we, our life should be meaningful, that we should live a life that is meaningful not just to us, but to the entire society. And so he made it a point every day. Whenever he, when he got up in the morning, the first thing he did after prayers was to make a re resolution that today I am going to be a better human being than I was yesterday. And then he would look at all the weaknesses in his attitude and in his character and try to eliminate those weaknesses and become a better human being. And that is how he was able to transform himself. He was you know, he always mentioned this in his writings, that he came from a very ordinary stock. There was nothing special about him. He wasn't endowed with any particular gifts or anything. He, he was just an ordinary young boy from an ordinary family, uh, but who was willing to make a difference in his life.